Hello and welcome to Addy Part 2, uh, Nuts and Bolts of Addy and Backward Design. I'm Christopher Hermalik, Associate Professor of Spanish at Onondaga Community College in Syracuse, New York. I'm also a PhD student of Instructional Design, Development and Evaluation at Syracuse University. And I'm Jennifer Doberful Quinlan from Brigham Young University. I work as an academic product consultant. So I work with faculty developing blended and online courses notably in the world languages and then um, for all of our online university curriculum. So today we're going to talk a little bit about um, Addy more in depth. So if you took the previous module, you learned a little bit about Addy and this probably looks familiar to you. Just to review, Addy includes the analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate stages. And Chris talked last time about how this isn't really a linear process, but rather that it's iterative. So today in this module, we'll go further into the analysis and design of an online course. And then this will be preparation for future modules that talk about the development, implementation, and evaluation. So by the end of this module, you should be able to explain the three steps of backward design and apply them to your own context for language learning should be able to write learning objectives and prepare a plan for sequencing content practice and assessment in your online course. So let's jump into backward design. We'll get some entire kind of the uh, the birth people of backward design. This is kind of a nice summary of a definition. One starts with the end the desired results or goals or standards, and then derives the curriculum from the evidence of learning called for by the standard and the teaching needed to equip students to perform. So there are three principal stages. First, identify the desired results, then determine the acceptable evidence of learning, and finally, design your learning experiences and instruction. Looks a little something like this if we put a graphic on it. So think about first identifying your desired results. What do you want your students to understand, to know, or be able to do at the end of the course? Then think about how will you check what they've learned? What will be the evidence of learning? And finally, then you will identify what learning activities will lead students to those desired results. So the premise of backward design um, is pretty straightforward. So for teachers, what this means is you'll plan learning experiences with the end in mind. It helps you avoid irrelevant lessons, know if students are prepared for their assessments, and if there are elements that need to be retaught. For students, the premise is that they know what to expect for the final exam, and in fact, that they progress more successfully through the course thanks to that scaffolded material that leads toward that desired end clarification that's very important. This is not teaching to the test. This is identifying your desired end result and ensuring that everything is aligned to lead to that end result. So Chris will help us get started working through these three primary stages, beginning with identifying the desired results. Thanks, Jen. Uh, as you begin to think about teaching online, you've probably decided to do so based on a reason. So there may have been a formal or an informal needs assessment uh, conducted to ensure that online language instruction was the best solution. And this is a great time to begin thinking about your summative evaluation. Uh, how will you know and measure if you met this need in the long run? Uh, you'll also want to analyze the learning context, so the curricular requirements for the course uh, and for other courses in other languages, uh, excuse me, another course in this language, uh, what technology is available to you, uh, the technology available, available to learners, uh, the nature of the infrastructure for online learning at your institution is also important. Uh, you should also begin to consider your learners themselves, so what are their learning preferences, uh, which aspects of face-to-face -face language instruction have been challenging for them in the past. Uh, you want to think also about how to accommodate your learners um, as they work in the online environment as well, uh, the tech support that will be available to learners throughout. And then finally, you also want to think about a task or a content analysis. Uh, so sometimes the curriculum uh, for the course may be developed while you're actually developing the online course itself. Uh, so in that case, it'll be important to determine the content that's essential for this course, uh, such that it'll fit within a larger system of other, of other language courses within your department, 
or potentially within an even larger system as well. We talked a bit before about uh, the systemic nature of instructional design, such that the course will be rigorous enough to transfer to other institutions. Uh, task and content analysis is also important for those of you building an online language course uh, that's uh, meant to be an equivalent of a face-to-face -face course. And so you may already be familiar with the course content itself, but you'll need to think about how you can accomplish many of these same tasks in an online course uh, that you might have just naturally been doing in your face-to-face -face environment. So in a later module, uh, you're going to be learning about communication in the online language environment. And right now, preparing for this before you develop your course is just absolutely essential. Let's talk briefly about learning objectives for a moment. Uh, students need to know what's expected of them uh, as they're taking a course. This way they don't end up, end up frustrated, uh, wondering about the purpose of the instruction. Uh, after we've identified our desired results, uh, we'll be ready to create learning objectives. A uh, learning objective is a statement of what learners should be able to do upon completion of a segment of instruction. Uh, if we know what tasks learners should be able to accomplish as a result of the instruction, we can then begin to formulate statements that will express this. So much like we did at the beginning of this module, Jen and I, what, we, what the two of us did, I would recommend that you make these objectives known to learners at the start of an instructional module so they know what's expected of them. Uh, learning objectives typically contain an action verb, such as describe or compare, uh, and they will also reference the content. So for example, students may describe their likes and dislikes in Spanish. They may compare their leisure activities with those they've learned about uh, from the Spanish speaking world. Uh, more detail could be added as well, such as the level of achievement or the conditions of performance as well too. So for example, one could specify that learners will describe three things they like, uh, two things they dislike in a webcam video recording with 90% accurate use of the, of the vocabulary and the grammatical forms learned in the chapter. So depending on your context though, this detail may or may not be necessary, of course. But uh, so why do we need learning objectives anyway? If written well, if they're not too restrictive, they can be very helpful in the classroom. And if we know what our students want to accomplish at the beginning, we will design better assessments for them because we'll be asking students to demonstrate to us whether or not they've reached an objective that either we or they have set. We'll also use instructional strategies, which will help students best reach these objectives. We also provide targeted practice to students to help them reach their goals. So let's think about this for a moment. If we plan instructional goals and learning objectives that are communicative in nature for our students, we realize then that the type of learning involved goes beyond simple structured practice activities. We realize we also need to provide practice in production of the language too. This is going to greatly affect the instructional strategies we use with our learners and the types of practice assignments and practice activities we use with them. So in other words, if we know that we want learners to be able to communicate in the language, we will want to provide them with opportunities for communication in the online environment, not just structured practice. A future module will provide more information on how to accomplish this in an online language course. Well, now that we've taken the time to learn how to create learning objectives, Jen is going to talk to you now about the next steps in backward design. Jen? Thanks, Chris. So now we need to determine acceptable evidence. You plan assessment before you plan your lessons in the backward design model. So think about what is an acceptable measure of the student's proficiency. Uh, I want to make a note, read this section, answer questions about this section. That's not necessarily assessing student learning outcome mastery. It's more reading comprehension. Now, if your objective is to be able to decode a written passage from an authentic text, then that kind of assessment is a great measure. If your desire is for students to write output, um, to produce output that is a response to something they've read, then a reading comprehension type assessment probably isn't the right fit. Um, think about varied assessment types, objective, matching, drag and drop, short answer, fill in the blank. There are lots of ways, oral, written, listening quizzes, and so forth. Um, but your institution might have specific measures that you need to think about for acceptable evidence as well. For example, state standards or common core, or maybe your department has specific benchmarks that they're concerned about. So um, think about that as you think of your acceptable evidence. Now you want to have formative and summative assessments as well. 
and a future module will talk more specifically about that. But let's delve into planning your experiences and instruction now that you've thought a little bit about assessment. Again, actual design of activities in the online environment will be discussed in a future module, but in the meantime, we want to remember that our instructional content should align with our assessment, which should align with our learning outcomes. When successfully implemented, backward design should prevent the likelihood of students saying something like, this item on the test wasn't in the content, or I learned this content, but we never got assessed on it. So think about the presentation of content, how students will practice and produce their language, and how they will communicate in the online environment. These are important questions as you design those learning experiences that, again, are aligned with the learning outcomes, right? Now think about how you plan design. In your classroom, a more traditional model, it might look something like what's on the right. You start by choosing your activities, then you develop your assignments, and then your assessments. And your focus is more on input. It's more teacher-centered. You might be thinking about getting through a certain amount of the textbook or getting um, students to a certain spot in their progress. Well, in backward design, it's more student-centered. So you start with the learning outcomes. You develop the assessments before the assignments. And your focus um, is on the desired goals of the lesson. Now, in the classroom, you might have a curricular team or staff meetings or a department or other support structures that kind of guide you in developing your curriculum or curriculum mapping or something like that. As you develop an online course, think about your support structure there, too. Maybe there's an accessibility office on campus, or maybe there's an instructional design team or a production shop that's going to help you with your course. Um, something you want to think about is design for all, a universal design concept. We'll talk about this more in the dig deeper portion of the content in this module, but this gives you an idea of kind of where to gauge your thinking and to get started. So believe it or not, Addy principles apply to backward design. When you analyze, you're thinking about those desired results. What do you want students to learn? When you design, you're designing your assessments first, and then your learning activities and thinking about what is a measurable, an, an acceptable measure of um, what they've learned. You'll develop, you'll implement, and then a very important point, evaluate. So at the end of that development process and implementation process, evaluate, are students actually learning what we stated in the beginning we wanted them to learn. So to, uh, to sum it all up, uh, you may remember that our objectives were to explain the three steps of backward design and apply them to your own context for online learning. And we did talk about that today. We also learned how to write learning objectives and understand their value as well. And you're going to find in the dig deeper section, you'll prepare a plan for sequencing content practice and assessment in an online course, and you also begin to identify instructional strategies as well as instructional media and resources that will help to support your plan. Uh, please keep in mind as well that you always have your mentor and the distance learning special interest group community to lean on for support and ideas. Thank you very much for your time.